Okay, welcome everybody. I think we'll get started. We're running just a couple minutes late, but uh, I'm Jason Detweiler from the University of Washington, and I was chair of the uh, poster judging committee. And I am here to present uh, Snowmass 2022 poster awards. So I'd first like to start out by thanking all of our participants in the poster session uh, for a very successful uh, hybrid format. We had 75 in-person uh, presenters and 15 remote pre presenters. Uh, the the uh, poster session itself was held last Monday during the reception. If you were there, uh, I hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, all uh, many of our professors, uh, professors, presenters, uh, over 50 of them provided a video and those videos are available on YouTube uh, uh, at the Snowmass Media channel as a playlist. And I encourage you all to see them. There's some really excellent videos. So we have four poster awards. Uh, and they total uh, their, their uh, cash award of $300 each, and they are geared towards early career presenters. And three of these were sponsored by the Open Access Journal Universe, and we had one sponsored by uh, its partner, uh, Symmetry. And we'd like to spend uh, extend a special thanks to our sponsors. So. Uh, our poster judging committee uh, was composed of one judge from each frontier, uh, Michiko Minty for the Accelerator Frontier, Alex Drilica-Wagner for the Cosmic Frontier, Ken Bloom for the Community Engagement Frontier, Peter Boyle for the Computational Frontier, uh, Isobel Ojalvo for the Energy Frontier, Petra Merkel for the Instrumentation Frontier, Aaron O'Sullivan for Neutrino Physics, uh, Bob Bernstein for Rare Processes and Precision, Mark Scher from the Theory Frontier, and John O'Rell from Underground Physics, and I'd like to give a big thank you to our judges. They put in many hours of work, some of them on very short notice. Uh, so thank you very much, judges. Uh, we judged the posters on, uh, on their content. Uh, that was one of the uh, main categories. Also the display, including accessibility concerns and the recorded presentation. And then we also had a big component for the in-person uh, posters. So uh, two of our awards uh, went to the top scores in just the first three categories. And this was available to all uh, presenters, both in-person and remote. And the other two uh, took into account all four uh, categories and those were available to those who uh, presented in person. Uh, I want to stress that there were really many great posters and the decision was very difficult. It took uh, lots of uh, uh, discussion and, and uh, uh, yeah, we had many very highly ranked uh, posters. So very nice job to all poster presenters. And without further ado, I'd like to present our four winners. And uh, the awardees, if you're available on Zoom, if you could turn on, your, uh, uh, turn on your camera while you're talking, then people in the audience will be able to see you. Hopefully this works, uh, maybe not. Oh, there we go. Okay, uh, so we have three of them present and another uh, person here. Oh, this is gonna be kind of funny. So let me do this. For, so for our first uh, awardee is Annika Gabriel uh, from Slack for uh, reshaping terahertz, oops, reshaping terahertz near fields for efficient particle acceleration. Uh, let's give Annika a round of applause. And our next uh, awardee is Karis Cleo Caraca, uh, whose poster was on prospects for the, I did it again, prospects for the measurement of TTH production in the opposite sign dilepton channel at uh, 14 TeV at the high luminosity LAHC. Uh, Karis, nice job. Uh, our next award, uh, which is from Universe, uh, this, the uh, presenter, Christina Wang, uh, could not be here. Uh, I think uh, her advisor, yes, Maria is here. And uh, Christina's poster was on search for neutral long-lived particles decaying in the CMS NCAP muon detectors. Uh, so let's give Christina a round of applause.
And our final awardee uh, from the Symmetry Magazine is uh, Kelly Stifter from Fermilab, uh, whose poster was on low energy calibration and characterization of novel dark matter detectors with a scanning laser device. Kelly, nice job. Okay, and so uh, I'd just like to say a final thank you to uh, all of our poster presenters and especially to our sponsors. Let me get this out of the way so that their logos are nice and clear. Yes, to our sponsors, Universe and Symmetry, uh, and to all of our judges and the local organizing committee for uh, organizing this first poster, uh, uh, poster session at a Snowmass uh, conference. And also to all the participants, uh, especially those of you who went around and uh, uh, asked our poster presenters questions and viewed their videos. So thank you very much. Oh, uh, if the poster awardees are still on here, if you could uh, uh, turn your video on again, uh, they want to get a picture and uh, let's try it. Thank you. Oh, I finished a little early. Good. So we have a five minute break until the sec session starts, I believe. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Out of something. What is that? You don't have permission. Can we take a look? Yeah. Yeah, you could press control or shift to each side. Oh, that's helpless. Okay. That's annoying. Huh? Alright, I'll see if I can fix that in five minutes. Okay. But if not, I mean, you can, like, we can, uh, we can pause the recording. Yeah. Following letting people know, does that people know about the time? Uh, there are There's time a, cards. Somebody there. with a bunch of sheets of paper down there. Oh, yeah.
you you will eat like apple juice. Yeah. So then, whenever they I had to finish on my. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like if they're pending to have a lunch. <laughs> so I had to stay here the rest of the time. Okay. Hello, welcome to the intersection session, um, mainly organized by Priska uh, Cushman. Uh, but I'm a Division of Astrophysics representative on the steering committee, um, but I'm a, really a particle physicist. I just did astrophysics a good deal of my time for the last 10 or 15 years. Um, the idea is to introduce people to the parts of these three different fields, which will be important, we think, for particle physics in the future. And so thinking about astrophysics, as you know, there's been huge numbers of intersections and in particular the cosmology and, and structure formation that we're already actively into in particle physics. But something that's on the horizon that I think is gonna be potentially really revolutionary is gravitational waves. So in spite of the fact there's a whole lot of other things that we could be also talking about, we decided to spend all the time in our, our bit on that topic. And we're lucky that Will Farr, who is a professor of physics at Stony Brook and the head of the gravitational wave group at the Simons Foundation uh, Center for uh, Computational Astrophysics at the Flatiron Institute, he's come and he's gonna tell us about it. So thanks, Will. The, set, the setup is gonna be three 20 minute talks and then uh, discussion with Fisco will lead. Thanks, Glennis, for that kind introduction. Um, I'm going to leave this slide up for one more second and just say, if you want to actually grab the slides here, that QR code will work. If you want to grab me, I sometimes tweet. I'm also on GitHub because I write a lot of code. I don't know why you'd want to do that. Get the slides. Um, OK, so I was charged with thinking about intersections between my field. And I will say I, I consider that really to be astronomy. I'm a gravitational wave astronomer. 
um, and uh, your field. And I could think of at least four that are exciting. Um, and maybe in the question period, you can think of some more and you can ask me questions about them. So uh, they are here. Um, QCD at low temperature and high density is a thing that gravitational wave astrophysics has a lot to say about. Um, this goes in the guise of other names, sometimes the neutron star equation of state or the pressure of nuclear material at twice nuclear density or et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I'll talk about that as I go through my slides. We uh, furnish tests of general relativity at high curvature, high velocities, high densities, however you like to, to think of it. Um, we furnish propagation tests of gravity. As you'll see in a minute, all of our sources are at cosmological distances. So the gravitons or the gravitational waves have been propagating through much of the universe to us. And if they interact with anything on the way, we can tell. Um, and then finally, which is probably the thing you've heard of the most, we provide properly calibrated cosmological distances without really having to rely on pesky astrophysics or astronomy. And there's a big asterisk on that statement, um, which I will come to when I, when I talk about that. Um, so I'm gonna try to give a little uh, introduction to gravitational waves and then talk about where we are today in these four items. And that's already exciting. And then hopefully I will really get your heart racing by talking about where we're gonna be in the future with these items, which is truly exciting. Um, okay, so quick review, gravitational waves. These are disturbances in space time, just like electromagnetic waves or disturbances in the electromagnetic field. You detect them by making precise measurements of space or time. Um, and this is a hypothetical gravitational wave passing through the screen, disturbing space. And you can see down here, uh, you know, to sort of give you an idea of how one might make this measurement is a schematic of an interferometer. As the wave goes through, one arm of the interferometer gets short, the other long, back and forth in an oscillatory pattern. That's a gravitational wave. Just like electromagnetic waves, they come in two polarizations. This one we call plus because of its pattern. And there's another one rotated at 45 degrees that we call cross. When I say 45 degrees, that's a clue. The graviton is spin two, not spin one, like the photon. But otherwise, things are basically the same between electromagnetic forces and, and gravitational forces. Um, that schematic has been realized in an instrument, which many of you have probably heard of, called LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. There are actually two such instruments, one not far from here in Washington State, and another one in Louisiana. They are very big interferometers. That arm that you see there is four kilometers long. The building in the center houses a laser and an optical setup to clean the laser and properly stabilize it and so on. But effectively, this is measuring, doing metrology on space um, between the laser in that big building. And then you can see down at the end, free hanging mirrors suspended in such a way that they can respond to a gravitational wave. This is LIGO in its early advanced configuration, that's late 2015. You can see here the strain noise. So this is a different, a, a fractional, excuse me, fractional displacement measurement. So one part in 10 to the minus 22 displacement on a four kilometer long arm, you can do the math. That's a very small absolute distance. That's the precision of the experiment here. Um, and by looking at this displacement noise curve, we can immediately see first that LIGO is gonna be sensitive to objects that are tens of solar masses. If you take a black hole solution, you put another black hole in orbit around it. You ask, what is the orbital frequency in those last moments before they plunge? It generates gravitational waves at that frequency. So LIGO is targeting stellar mass black holes at cosmological distances. So this is actually a key point in the LIGO experiment. Um, no gravitons, or very few gravitons, are harmed in the making of these measurements. Unlike optical telescopes, we are not graviton buckets. We don't catch them and destroy them. Instead, we interact coherently with the gravitational field. We measure field amplitudes, not energies. And happily, our sources are also phase coherent. 
So that means our sensitivity, rather than following an inverse square law, our sensitivity drops off like one over the distance, not one over the distance squared. So if you're sensitive to field amplitudes and the gravitational field is order one distorted down near where some black holes are colliding, and your amplitudes have to fall off like one over R, but strain is a fractional distance, it's dimensionless, what's left? The strain amplitude goes like some factors that are order one and a little hard to calculate, times the Schwarzschild radius of the system divided by the distance. And so if you take a 10 solar mass black hole and you calculate its Schwarzschild radius, that is to one gigaparsec, which is a goodly fraction of the universe, about 10 to the minus 23. So just from looking at this plot, we can see that we're looking for stellar mass compact objects most of the way across the universe. And that is indeed what LIGO detects. LIGO is not the only game in town. This is a picture of the gravitational wave landscape. Over here is LIGO. Here is an extension to LIGO called Cosmic Explorer, which will be about 10 times more sensitive. And I will say the punchline up front, Cosmic Explorer will see every single binary black hole merger that occurs in the universe and just about every single neutron star merger that occurs in the universe. That's about a quarter million mergers a year. Get them all. Um, there is at intermediate frequencies of sort of order minutes to hours, a space mission called LISA being led by the European Space Agency. It should launch in 2035. NASA is playing a supporting role in that mission. It may play yet a larger role. Um, and today there are groups that use pulsars the regular ticking of pulsars to make space-time measurements. That's called pulsar timing arrays. Those objects, uh-oh. Are we good? Okay, cool. Sorry for the interruption. Um, those, those objects are sensitive to gravitational waves on sort of year-long time scales or 10-year time scales. And um, as we improve our radio telescope technology, there is, uh, plan the square kilometer array coming online on, on an order of the next decade that will grab an order of magnitude or one and a half orders of magnitude more pulsars to time and therefore improve the sensitivity of the pulsar timing array. Um, to give you a sense of where this is, right, talking about gravitational waves from the CMB, the CMB is seven decades off the left-hand side of that plot. Um, so I know there was some discussion earlier in the meeting about looking at backgrounds from you know, cosmological backgrounds from inflation. I think that is a lovely thing to do. I'll have more to say about it a little bit later in the talk, but I would caution you that where inflation has been constrained by the CMB is something like almost 20 orders of magnitude in frequency from where we would make those sorts of measurements with ground-based detectors. You can paint that optimistically. We have a very long lever arm to constrain the slope of the power law. You can paint that pessimistically. If you know what's going on here, you have no idea what's happening, 20 orders of magnitude down. In any case, we will make the measurement and then we will know. Uh oh. So I'm gonna talk now about two firsts from ground-based gravitational wave detectors. One of them is the first binary black hole merger. GW150914 came in September of 2015. Um, and at that time, there were only the two LIGO detectors operating. These days, there's more gravitational wave detectors in the world. Um, but here you can see the strain that was recorded in Hanford and in Livingston. The Hanford strain has been time shifted and flipped in sign to match up with the Livingston strain, given where we think the source was coming from on the sky. You can see they match well. Um, we know this is a binary black hole signal because it starts at low frequency and progresses to relatively high frequency, increasing in amplitude as the black holes spiral in towards each other, and then stops at about 250 hertz and decays away in a ring down as sort of the remnant starts out as a peanut, oosh, 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 its way down to a remnant curve black hole. I'll talk about the rest of these panels in a minute when I come to, to precision tests of GR. This was the first gravitational wave signal from compact objects ever recorded. It was a big deal. We were all very excited. It was the culmination of several decades worth of experimental work to build detectors. Um, it's great. Another first, um, and equally relevant to fundamental physics. Oh, that's just not going to play. Okay, so uh, that's GW170817, which was the first detection of 
a binary neutron star merger. And if the movie had played, you would have heard this source starting at low frequency, but making many cycles, not eight, like you saw with 1509.14. And it would chirp its way up. And then you would hear a ding after. The thing that was very exciting about this source was it was observed both in gravitational and electromagnetic waves. It was followed two seconds after the gravitational wave signal terminated with a GRB, okay, a gamma ray burst. Those two seconds coming from a source at 40 megaparsecs, which is about 120 million light years, tell you that the speed of gravity and the speed of light are identical to two seconds divided by 120 mega years. If you do the math, that's about a part in 10 to the 15. This single source killed, my sympathies, I'm very sorry, many extensions to GR that would have predicted different propagation speeds for gravitons and photons. Okay, and that's an example of something that we can do with gravitational wave propagation that is inaccessible really to, to any other experiment. Another thing that this source does, so unlike black holes, black holes are just made of gravity. They don't have a tidal response, but neutron stars are made of stuff. So as they get close to each other, they stretch. There's a tidal field, the neutron star stretches, and we can see that distorting the waveform here right near the end. And by carefully measuring that stretching, we can constrain what sort of planetary physicists would call the tidal love number if you're into elastic solids, but a measure of how elastic the neutron star is. We call that number lambda two. And that in turn is a function of the equation of state of nuclear matter inside the neutron star, principally at about two times nuclear density. That's you know, sort of the middle layers of the neutron star where most of the stretching is happening live at about twice the nuclear density. So this is a constraint directly on QCD at zero temperature and high density, which is a regime that's not achievable in pretty much any other circumstance. And you can see here our constraints on the tidal deformability of the two neutron stars already ruled out a couple of honestly a little bit crazy equations of state. As our sensitivity gets better and as we go from one source to 100,000 sources, these constraints just statistically beat down the noise and get very, very tight. We also use these systems to test GR in the strong field. Um, so here's an example of now the second row of plots here. This is again 1509.14. The gray band that you can see here is a prediction of the waveform that you would expect if you can solve the binary black hole in spiral and general relativity. Deviations of the real signal from that prediction would indicate that general relativity is not the correct theory of gravity. We saw no such deviations. GR has passed every test we've thrown at it. But essentially, that's how we test strong field gravity. GR makes very definite predictions about how black hole mergers should proceed, and each one we check. Additionally, after the merger happens and you've got a black peanut and it's ringing its way down to a static remnant Kerr solution, the ring down can be thought of as taking a Kerr black hole perturbing it, hitting it with a big hammer, actually another black hole, and watching it ring, right? We're talking about the normal modes of the space-time around a Kerr black hole. Those are a direct probe of the geometry of the Kerr space-time. And in this system, we found two such normal modes. Now, some of you may remember a Kerr black hole only needs two numbers to describe it, a mass and a spin. A mode needs two numbers to describe it, a frequency and a damping rate. So the first mode that you find pins down the mass and spin of the black hole. And from there, the rest of the spectrum of the Kerr black hole is determined. Any additional modes you find must match up with the general relativistic prediction. We perform that spectroscopy. And in fact, the second mode matched the frequency that you would expect from GR to about 20%. Again, that's a fairly wishy-washy measurement, 20%. But when you have hundreds of thousands of sources at signal to noise ratios that are 10 times larger than this, suddenly these constraints start to stack and you're talking about sub percent probes of the space time in the strong field regime around a Kerr black hole. Okay, the final point I wanna make 
is distances. So um, this is point number four. In gravitational waves, there is a constant of nature, c to the fifth over g. Um, that happens to be three times 10 to the 59 ergs per second in units that astronomers prefer. Or if you like, think about it that way, about a million times as luminous as a supernova. This is the luminosity at the end of any black hole merger. Doesn't matter what the mass is. And the reason is that the total energy emitted scales like some fraction of mc squared. So the energy emitted goes up with mass. But the orbital time scale is comparable to the light crossing time of a Schwarzschild black hole. And that also gets bigger with mass. So energy per time stays constant. So our sources are calibrated standard candles, at least if GR is correct. Um, and even if GR isn't, most modified theories of gravity more or less preserve the scale. So for us, distances are easy. Red shifts are hard. Right? If you're trying to do cosmology, you want distances and redshifts. With photons, the redshifts are easy. You look at spectra. The distances are hard because you don't have any naturally standardizable astronomical objects. For us, distance is easy, redshifts hard. And the reason is we measure masses from the frequency evolution of the signal. So as it redshifts, the mass that we observe is related to the intrinsic mass in the source frame by a redshifting factor, one plus c. So one way to break this conundrum, it's sort of the easy mode way to do it, is to see a counterpart electromagnetically and measure the redshift of the host. Then you're exploiting the strengths of both. This is multi-messenger astronomy. This was done for 1708-17. We made a gravitational wave Hubble diagram. It has one point on it. As we collect more and more mergers, we will have more and more situations where we are lucky enough to get a gravitational wave and an electromagnetic counterpart. And we will take the intrinsic sort of 10% uncertainty or 15% uncertainty in the Hubble constant from this measurement and beat it down to well under sub percent uncertainty. Another way to do cosmology is if you happened to know what sort of mass your system should come in, then you can also measure a redshift, right? If I know the true mass of my source through some other means that the observed mass tells me the redshift, I get the distances from the luminosity, easy peasy. These two papers are about doing that for neutron stars, which are all about 1.4 solar masses in truth. So if you see them at 2.8 solar masses, you know they must have been at redshift one and so on and so on. You can also play this game in black holes. If there's a mass scale imprinted on the black hole mass function, this is actually from a paper I wrote a few years ago where there was a suggestion that if stars get too big, they blow themselves up before they make black holes. So there's a maximum mass to black holes, say. If you can track that mass scale, as you move out in distance, the redshift gets larger, the apparent mass gets larger. If you track that mass scale over cosmic time with reasonable assumptions about how many sources advanced LIGO is gonna see, you can get a 3% measurement of H of Z out towards redshift one, which corresponds to plus or minus two kilometers per second per megaparsec in H naught. That, is much more the flavor of supernova cosmology. There's here a standardizable mass scale, and one has to understand enough about the stellar physics to believe that it's standardizable, but we think it might be. Um, OK, so as of today, we have of order 100 systems. You can peruse this slide at your leisure. Most of them are binary black holes. A few of them are binary neutron stars. We even have some mixed partnerships of black holes and, uh, black holes and neutron stars. Um, so we've got the whole menagerie, but what does the future look like? So the future on the ground looks 10 times bigger. So I think you may have heard about this in some of the other sessions here. The American plan for the next generation of gravitational wave detectors is called Cosmic Explorer. And the idea is to take LIGO and scale it up by a factor of 10. The uh, logic behind that is that the noise sources in LIGO are not sensitive to how long your arms are. But the stretching of space absolutely is. So there will be technological improvements, of course, but the bulk of the improvement in sensitivity just comes from making the signal 10 times louder because your arms are 10 times longer. OK, so that's what's happening here. You go from this sort of noise level to that sort of noise level. This is what that would look like in truth. This is a lazy Tuesday afternoon in the Cosmic Explorer control room. Uh, it's about 20 minutes of time on this axis. This is the frequency axis here. And you can see three signals in this 20 minutes. 
a, um, a neutron star merger at redshift one, signal to noise ratio 38, that would be the loudest event we have seen to date. Five minutes later, there's a 1010 black hole merger at redshift 1.5, signal noise ratio 130. And then a few minutes after that, another neutron star merger, this time at redshift two, signal noise ratio 23. So if you build Cosmic Explorer, life gets exciting. In this 20 minute stretch, which is slow, in fact, the signals come a little faster than this. This is a downward fluctuation in the signal rate. In this 20 minute stretch, you have three signals that are louder than anything we've got before from distances that are much further than anything we've seen before and enable the same sorts of precision tests that I've been talking about. And I'm gonna end just with an analogy. I can't help it, I'm an astronomer. This is from Russell, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram in 1914. These are stars, luminosity, color, but really temperature. And stars live in this strip we call the main sequence because they burn hydrogen in their cores. Russell didn't know that. He just said, golly, they all seem to live on this line. Okay, that's what life was like in 1914. And that's very much like what gravitational wave astronomy is now. There's about 100 dots on this plot. Somebody put them on there with a pen. This is what that same plot looks like today from the Gaia satellite. Now, Gaia is going to observe billions of sources. We won't have billions of gravitational wave events from Cosmic Explorer, but we will have hundreds of thousands. And you can see there's a main sequence, but it has width to it. And you can see a little turn off here and stars go up the giant branch, then down over here, cooling white dwarfs. We are going to obtain the same level of insight into compact objects from objects as we have obtained over the last few years. Um, and I will say, all of these things that I have talked about get magnificently better with a quarter million sources a year, sources with signal noise ratio over 100. The future is going to look very bright. Thank you. So, so. Uh, So uh, while uh, Dave is setting up, uh, let me introduce uh, David Herzog. Uh, he's a uh, professor of physics here at the University of Washington. Of course, most of you know him uh, as the founding spokesperson of Gemini's 2 and uh, the expert on muon physics, for which, in fact, he received the Tom Bono Prize in uh, nuclear physics this year, 22. Uh, David was also a chair of Nuclear Science Advisory Committee for four years, uh, as recently as, I believe, two years ago. So he's an expert on nuclear physics uh, and exciting projects in it. And that's what he will be uh, talking to us today. All right. How do I move the slides? We're having technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> God. At least on my slides, I left the top right corner intentionally blank so they could put something in there that has been overriding a few of the slides earlier. <laughs> it was a challenge. I wanted to use that corner <laughs> for something. I'm just going to entertain you here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, something uh, like a decoration or something. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, which one is, is yours? Uh, the one the one on the far right there, the PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah, that's the one. Is this the advancer, by the way? Thing you should put in the top right corner if it comes up. Yeah, it'll come up. Okay, excellent. Sorry about that. Okay, so uh, maybe I'm too loud. I was asked to uh, to talk about the intersections of nuclear particle physics, 
And it's kind of a, an interesting topic because this is this stuff falling apart left and right, guys. Yeah, I'll keep going. Because the, there's even conferences on this, big conferences that occur on the intersections of nuclear and particle physics every three years. So for about 40 years, this topic has been on the community's mind. You know, I hope to show you some of the things. By the way, one is, as an advertisement, one is coming up there. You could kick that box up and right, here. It won't go any further. It won't go any further. Okay, so there goes my great idea. Uh, okay, <laughs> it was a good idea, I thought. Does it, this doesn't advance either now, huh? I did, <laughs> believe me, I'm pressing the down button. So I actually was thinking about this in a, in a kind of one of the challenging ways. And I put some silos here, as you see, and the silos are typical, not only in our field that there are silos that partition us among, among different fields, but in industry and so on. And I thought about, you know, two, two people who are interested in the same physics problem. And this happens in my, my field a lot. I'm taking it away. Okay. And I said, okay, hello, I'm funded by DOAGP. The other says, oh, I'm funded by, you know, DOANP. Can we work together on something? I don't know. You know, why, why not? So let's, let's explore that a little bit along the way. But in fact, you know, lots of organizations have the benefits and drawbacks of silos. And there are benefits of these things because that, that defines scope and the scope and missions. And the DOA is mission-driven kind of a uh, agency. And uh, there, there are also some drawbacks on that. But I think what, in my experience, because I've probably, as much as anyone, lived on the boundary with, with one foot in, in one type of physics and one in another as, as anyone, uh, their boundaries are often uh, fuzzy. And this fuzzy is very, very important. What would, bring a, what would bring a connection between a kind of a standard HEP project and a standard nuclear physics project or a nuclear physics funded uh, group and a high energy funded group, what would bring them together? Sort of, I'll, I'll show a couple things that I think make some sense. So let's first start about what, what are we sort of after, especially in an audience like this one. Each one of our, our subfields has a broader, a broader dis, uh, discussion of what they go after and so on, but there's the overlap areas here include, the mission is, you know, it's discovery, you know, boldly go where no one has gone before. Every one of us would love to write down, you know, how we have moved the envelope somehow or another in our respective investigations. So for example, one of the things that comes up on any slide, you can't see a single you know, colloquium slide on particle physics without somebody talking about you know, somehow completing the standard model, giving you a list of the things that are wrong with it, and you know, first saying something nice about it, then telling you what's wrong with it. And then telling you, you know, then there's a lot of solutions. That's called the whole field of phenomenology and model building and so on. But I want to also emphasize, because actually the backbone of the statement above is the statement in the middle, which is establishing the standard model parameters is a huge amount of the things that we do, writing down and figuring out what the laws of physics are in particle physics. And I, I won't, don't need to remind you of the big surprise this April of the new mass of the W that came out so many standard deviations away from the electroweak expectations. And, and in this conference, another beside this, in this conference, we also are still elusive, looking for the elusive absolute neutrino mass. This is one of the main particles you all talk about in many of the sessions. There are 236 mentions of neutrino in snow mass nine, and we don't know the mass. So then there's the couplings, the, you know, the alpha QED, strong, the Fermi coupling, the gravitational. Don't ever look at this uh, unless you really want to have a discussion. This is a mess. Um, the, the structure of the interactions is important. The neutrino properties, uh, generations, lepton number flavor, all this stuff, CP violation permit. All of this stuff is what we write down as our recipe of what, what particle physics is. And then, you know, to add to that, I'm here talking kind of more of the standard particle things, but let's not forget that, in fact, over the decades, you know, for many, many decades, we've seen the evolution of particle physics being something that defined and found the hadronic structures to the more, in some sense, a lot of that has swung over toward nuclear physics, but there's still an overlap, especially in the exploration for exotic hadrons, as we'll see in a minute. 
Okay, so this little short, I have a bunch of little short chapters. They all look like this. You'll know when the chapter changes because you'll see this. And the first one is really on the standard model and, and beyond. And I want to start off here with this button. There we go. <laughs> with something I, I cooked up a long time ago when I, uh, right after the LHC had its first run and I was thrown into kind of a mix of LHC talks. I was, a, I was on hors d'oeuvre at somebody's conference, given what I do. I just sort of a little sidekick show. And uh, I was thinking about, you know, what is the main tool of this community? And that's basically the collider in one way or another. The collider has been such a workhorse. And the idea is essentially uh, to think of this as the standard model. And this was basically a, a cast. This is a real fort that was never uh, breached in the history of, of time, although many, many attempts. And the first thing is basically the, the LHC turned on kind of at a low energy and, and, and basically fired its, uh, its, its first shot. Boom. And of course, nothing happened. So what did you guys do? You went out and you, you built a bigger cannon, you know? <laughs> and, the, and so right after that, you, you bang. And I remember this because I'm a, I'm a customer of this information. I'm very interested and you finding something that may go into my own interests. And so the next fire, boom, and there was a little shot. If you remember, it's got a 750 GeV bump. It, it, it was a hundreds of papers. It was there, it was exciting. We all thought we had supersymmetry or whatever we thought we had, and then it was gone and it came, it came, came up empty. So what, what else can you do when that happens? And what else you can do is, well, this is the new thing and I'm, I'm viewing it like this, you know, if you, start to ram the heck out of the thing is with high intensity, you are now entering the era of precision and intensity physics and not just the energy scale. You're now looking for the deviation of some prediction by a small amount because you have so many counts in that histogram. But that's still not what people in my community do. Okay, what people in my community do when they wanna crack the standard model is we go in a different way. So we tunnel in, we use quantum tunneling to try to get in that castle through loops, through quantum loops, typically. And so those things look like this. This is just a tiny, tiny subset of a flash of all the kinds of one-off experiments that are scattered around the world that are in big laboratories and small laboratories. This is a neutron laboratory. This is a muon factory. Uh, of course, Fermilab, you know very well. This is over at SEMPA. This is the ADMX experiment. This is in the physics department across the street for the Mercury one night. These are, this experiment's this big. And these things are all looking for physics beyond the standard model in, in different ways. Is lepton number conserved? These are things you don't normally do with a collider. Is the origin of matter and antimatter asymmetry in the universe through EDMs or through neutrinos and their own antiparticles and double beta decay? What is dark matter? Axion searches and WIMP searches. And then are, these are sort of a little more common. What are the deviations of the standard model, like in G minus two, or in parity violating electron scattering, and so on. And lots and lots and lots of atomic physics experiments, which are cute and lovely, and I don't know them all. Uh, that would be another speaker again. I'm going to use this as an, I have four examples real quick, Ralph, to, to flash this for you. And I, what I thought about in this, this diagonalization of our intersection is here's, here's a piece of physics in which different communities have done their own experiments to contribute to a physics story. And this, is, this particular story is the running of sine squared theta w versus the renormalized energy scale. Over here on the left, you see an atomic physics experiment. In the middle here, you see parity violating electron scattering experiments. Over here, you see the collider experiments the older ones at LEP and SLC, and then the, the latest, this really came to me this morning, this is the LHC. Now, it's not over here lost, it's, it's just the arrow pushes it over to here in the Tevatron. This is the really beautiful story of telling us how we understand some electric weak physics. And where's new physics to be found? It would be in the deviations here. There were things for dark photons and dark Zs and things like that. Okay, just to let you know now, a little bit occasionally some nuclear physics contributions to this. These are two big experiments, which are, you see them floating out here. That's because they're being built right now with this kind of precision and they'll go vertically above, above here at some point. These are big priorities within the community. Here's one you wouldn't think about at all. This is basically, you think about the weak interaction 
B minus A, the weak interaction, and you think, okay, what about the scalar and tensor currents? Well, here's an example in which two things that couldn't be more opposite. In nuclear physics experiment, you can do it a Van de Graaff, and the beta decay of helium-6, for example, or neon-19, and you're looking at the spectrum, and that produces limits here in scalar and tensor currents, which can be compared, here's the diagram, which can be care, compared directly to LHC PP scattering events in absence of transverse, transverse uh, uh, events in the distribution. What did I just hit? What is that? That's a scary buttons here. Whew. Okay. Okay, here's another one which I think overlaps all of our communities. So one of the clear important things to do is to look for any hints of how we can understand baryogenesis. So electric dipole moments is clearly one of the main ones, CP violation. So they're free of standard model backgrounds because they're just way off into to the smallness. They probe high scales. And this chart, I think this, I can't say if it's Vincenzo or not, but I've seen this chart many times in our nuclear physics presentations. And there were lots of presentations here. I, I didn't try to be fully uh, citing all the snow mass talks. So basically there's a fundamental, there could be a fundamental CP violating phase up here. But as you trickle down through the techniques of how you're going to do it, whether you do it with the electron system or muon system or a neutron system or these atomic systems, these paramagnetic or diamagnetic systems, you know, there, there, there's a connection there that has to work its way all the way up. And for us to understand CP violation, we have to actually understand this entire flow up, up to the fundamental place where it actually is occurring. Not where it's buried in an atom, but where is it actually occurring? Off to the right here, I show three things. The incredible improvement in the electron, which comes from down here, in, down here, in the electrons, electric dipole moment over the years. This is an atomic, phys this is an atomic physics community, AMO community. In the middle here, we're watching the neutrons and there's a new experiment, big new experiment, high priority, gonna be coming on at the SNS in the nuclear physics community. And down here, although this is blue and you think the proton's doing okay, that's actually the neutron repeated. And these red things are just wishes and dreams, but you've been presented with these wishes and dreams at this, at this conference for what the high energy physics community could do with, with a storage ring. Okay, let's go on. Okay. This is example four of, of the story. When I started in physics, the textbook about neutrinos said the ones that those of you my age said, which is the neutrino had zero mass, it wasn't a very interesting thing. And then all of a sudden we know it oscillates, we know it has a mass, we know it has a rich thing to figure out. There's so much work to be done. These are places where the community can make real measurements, not just, not just fishing trips, but they can make real measurements. It's a bit siloed, whether you're allowed to look at man-made neutrinos or radioactive source neutrinos or neutrinos from the sun, you know, that's how you decide who, who pays you or who supports your group at some sort of a strange way. But, you know, an HEP focus is, uh, is on for accelerators, oscillation physics, the hierarchy, sterile neutrinos, CP, possible CP violation, and then coherent nuclear scattering from reactors, similar things. Nuclear physicists look at, or were allowed to look at neutrinos from the sun, not allowed to look up there. And, uh, you know, this is this cycle. Uh, and then very, very importantly, the uh, double beta, du neutrinoless double beta decay. There you go. So these are areas in which nuclear physics, there's some overlap, but there's not a lot of overlap, but the whole story is required to understand about neutrino physics. So here's an example where I'm gonna diagonalize a different way. I diagonalized before by physics, which in which different communities filled in the story. This is one question, one physics community with a, an incredibly broad in, uh, um, community involvement. And that's the G minus two, which I've been involved in for a very, very long time. So 200 physicists combine and do all their work for 10 years or more just to get one number, not, not even two numbers, we get one number out of this work. And so the groups that are in this are funded by DOE, international HEP groups, the nuclear physics groups from DOE and NSF, atomic physics, accelerator and storage ring groups, which I didn't even know were there. Uh, in the Italian group, there's an Italian optics institute that's in this thing. And then we have the theorists, the theory collaboration here. And then all of these experiments that do E plus E minus absolute cross, all of this is required for the story. Notice the experiments are sitting here in Seattle on a very sunny day like you've had where the theorists are confused in a cloudy day in a similar time. To prove that this is true, on the day of the release in March of 2021, 
the, the release of that paper, there were four papers published at once. And look where they were published. The story paper of our community, as, as, as Vernon Hughes would say, the, the, re the record of our community is PRL. But then the, the, the procession of the muons, detector is a normal thing, that's in PRD. The magnetic field is in PRA, that's atomic physics and nuclear physics. And then the beam dynamics is in PRAB, accelerators and beam. We have three completely different kind of communities of experts to go in that. It was a very unusual and challenging thing, but it was representative of how a broad community can combine to one number. And it's super nice that the agencies understand that as well and funded people for their contributions to this. Okay, you know, the technical expertise, this is precision magnetometry. This is beam modeling. This is the standard stuff. A lot of people in the audience know like, calibrations and calorimeters and wiggle plots. Okay. And then I was almost done and then I realized we didn't even get the number from all of that. We don't get that number until the atomic physics numbers from ionium experiments and G minus two of the electron are folded in happily packaged up by co-data. We need those kind of constants too as a community. Okay, QCD and hadronic physics, real short. I used to do this work, but then I've forgotten the name of all the exotic particles. And uh, you know, I used to know them all by heart. <laughs> uh, now, experiments. Obviously, the quark gluon plasma has been a major part of nuclear physics for many, many decades. But of course, it's also embedded in the LHC physics, right? And then, interesting enough, what's really happening is what happens to exotic hadrons. People have been searching for exotic hadrons for a long, long time. I, I did a lot of that myself, struck out miserably. But when, once the LHCB and Bell has started looking in the high in the, the heavy quark sector, it's remarkable what has been found. You know, I think I have it on the next slide here. I just learned there are 18 exotic, 62 new states and 18 exotics, you know, in the systems like these kind of terraquark and pen, pentaquark states. And then we're also interested in the spin, we continue for decades to be interested in the spin decomposition of the muon. This is uh, the nucleon. This is well beyond the simple sum rules. It's not just you have three quarks or you have some angular momentum and you have some glue and so on. You glue it all together and add it up and it ought to equal a half. It's much more complicated than that. And a, and a question I used to think was rather trivial was like, what's the mass of the proton? We have three light quarks and a bunch of goop in there. It didn't seem too hard, but that's one of the main that's one of the main drivers of the EIC. And I didn't understand that until I saw a high energy QCD talk at the INT here about two months ago. And then I thought, oh, this is way more complicated and gonna be a much tougher investigation. This is the kind of thing that the electron ion collider is gonna be uh, providing data for. And of course, all this stuff with the most perfect, this is not new stuff right now, but still the interest in the most perfect liquid. And then what's more recent, is trying to find QCD first order phase transitions through things like the beam energy scan, find out really what's going on at the early universe. I think that's of interest to particle physicists, although it's driven mostly by nuclear physicists. Okay, I think this is important to acknowledge is the technological influence of, usually it's from HEP toward other communities. And here I want to do a shout out to the community that's hosting this meeting because it's very, very important. Uh, detector technologies, high-speed electronics, Monte Carlo modeling, these things are very, uh, very, and, and, and sometimes it's the other way, but the support for these developments is beneficial to the whole community. I'm on time. And I just listed stuff, the first thing that came to my mind, I'm hardly a detector electronics expert. I do stuff, I build some stuff, but I'm, you know, I know, I know an instrumentation detector expert when I see one. And a lot of that, when we try to do our experiments is, der is derived a lot from what your community has developed for these exceptional experiments at, at the LHC and otherwise. Fast sensors, fast electronics, incredible things that you needed to have in order to deal with the luminosities and the event rates that, and uh, the complexities that you have. And we've gra we steal left and right. We're, we're, we're absolutely happy to steal everything. And who hasn't benefited from Jayant and Root and, and some of the new things like that, even classes, even the undergraduate class I was teaching, they, they knew how to do roots so they could analyze data coming down from cosmic rays. It's, it's not to be forgotten that somebody has supported that work. And I'm at stop, which probably means I shouldn't go, look, that's clever, you stopped the slides. And, and, and I just had one practical thing on the intersections, just to say that 
in nuclear physics, we are lucky. We are the stewards of four accelerators here. And the, there is a vital accelerator program with a future for the electron ion collider. And the nuclear physics program supports this phrase, a targeted program of fundamental symmetries and neutrino research that opens new doors. And these are the sorts of things that are funded by the DOE uh, program. You've seen me mention them. And I just want to mention that just like P5, we have this process of the long range plan, which goes back a long time. It's been exceptionally successful. The community comes together. We write the plan and DOE and NSF follow the plan. It's been very successful for our community and we're about ready, embarking on a new one. I only have this, this is my last slide, so I can end right now. My guess is what's gonna be important will be double beta decay, the neutrino mass, the EIC and its detectors, the, these big projects, and the things I'm not, that aren't gonna get voted in, I certainly am not gonna guess about. Thank you very much. Hello, good. Uh, so we're now at our third talk and I would like to uh, introduce Peter Dennis, who is a senior researcher, senior scientist at LBL at the Molecular Foundry. And I'm going to read verbatim what he told me he's working on now. Um, it's uh, including the design of an all superconducting electron microscope to study quantum phenomena with atomic resolution at ultra low temperatures. They sort of click, check each of the things we're all interested in anyway. And so I'm very excited to hear what he has to say. So, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm here to talk about the intersection or union or pick your operator uh, between high energy physics, particle physics and basic energy sciences. Uh, we each have our characteristic tables. Yes. And, and, Yep, yep, that's the point, there you go. So this is what I think my assignment is. Uh, in 20 minutes, describe commonalities where we speak the same language, uh, potential common interests. I was asked to comment on key investments. There's no way to be comprehensive. Uh, and uh, I'm going to admit that this is a somewhat biased by my own personal uh, biases. Uh, just to say, uh, in terms of me, uh, there was a period of time where my characteristic energy scale went up and then there's been a time where the characteristic energy scale goes down and retirement is at KT log two. Uh, disclaimer, the views herein do not represent, et cetera. Uh, so uh, in basic energy sciences, uh, there are many interesting things to study. And there was an exercise, there's been ongoing exercise to summarize these in terms of grand challenges uh, that uh, range from things like how we can control processes uh, at the level of electrons, how we can uh, do things at the nanoscale, how we can be inspired by what bi biology does, uh, et cetera. So these are the aspirational goals. Then more practically, there's work on discovering and designing new materials, understanding and controlling complex chemical reactions. Uh, and oftentimes these things are done with a somewhat practical uh, view toward them, uh, like keeping our planet uh, from either burning up or uh, making sure that we have some fuel to go along. So a lot of these things uh, actually have some application. What, I, what I'm gonna focus on, because I think it's where there is certainly the biggest historical commonality, and that was a good lead-in from the last talk, are the use of uh, X-rays, neutrons, and electrons uh, to study uh, structure, uh, composition, and, and characterize materials. So all of us want to see small things. We just have a slightly different definition of what the scale of small is. Uh, and so one may be looking um, at some structure, could be static, could be dynamic, uh, could be operating in some environment. And one wants to, by some method, 
uh, be able to reconstruct what one is seeing based on you know, the information that's available. Uh, the, ki the kinds of length and time scales typically of interest are atomic resolution, so angstroms. Uh, the speed of sound is one atom, one angstrom in 100 femtoseconds. Uh, one would generally like millivolt energy resolutions uh, for uh, seeing states and doing chemical sensitivity. Uh, then one has to deal with the properties of whatever, whatever the probe is that one has. Um, this is a common problem. And the field of view ideally ranges somewhere uh, from a micron uh, to a meter. So this is done with uh, electrons, photons, and neutrons. Uh, and they have uh, quite a wide range of scattering cross sections and the kinds of energy resolutions uh, and characteristic times that can be obtained. Uh, the sources are reactor distillation sources, storage rings, free electron lasers, electron microscopes. And in the DOE complex, uh, these are the various facilities where those are available, uh, uh, reactor, splation, neutron source uh, for uh, X-ray synchrotron storage rings, uh, free electron laser, and various uh, nanoscale uh, science centers. Uh, there are a lot of users that use these things. Um, so this is a chart that shows that over the past some number of years, uh, this is now up to uh, 16, 17,000 users. There was a dip uh, due to this 100 nanometer particle uh, that we're still bothered by. Uh, so now to see these small things, uh, as, as a reminder, because you look at things that are too small. Uh, so one, one uh, relevant thing is how many is the flux? How many probes uh, can I get per second for some unit area? But then there's the brightness. What sort of solid angle can I pack that into? That's interesting because a factor of two in 2D spatial resolution needs a factor of two to the fourth uh, in brightness. So brightness is a very important quantity. And then there's spectral brightness or brilliance, which is that brightness uh, as a uh, for unit energy wavelength or something. And to make things confusing, uh, people who throw neutrons, photons, and electrons uh, measure this uh, in, in different units for various reasons. Some experiments need flux, some need brightness, some need spectral brightness. So there's not one universal perfect source for everything. So I'm gonna focus a lot on uh, accelerator and detector tools because uh, that's certainly where there's been uh, the most commonality. Uh, and as a reminder of the second tool that uh, was uh, used in kind of the material study community that came from the particle physics community was this uh, uh, study machine uh, to build a 300 MeV accelerator. Um, and when it was turned on, it had this very annoying synchrotron radiation that came out of it. Uh, some people found that useful. So the first generation of machines in the 60s and 70s were uh, like at, at Slack, were uh, particle physics machines that parasitically the X-rays were used. Second generation became dedicated sources like NSLS-1 at Brookhaven. Uh, third generation uh, came up with these uh, clever undulating magnetic structures uh, where uh, uh, with these, uh, with these uh, different magnetic uh, structures, north, south, north, south, the radiated uh, photon length uh, is the undulator period divided by the energy squared. So you can turn centimeter oscillations into nanometer oscillations. Um, and these devices uh, inspired third generation light sources. Uh, that uh, brought the brightness uh, up by a factor of about 10 to the four. And so those are uh, prolific today. When these uh, light, light sources were being made, uh, people perfected how the accelerator should be structured uh, as shown here. And uh, that consisted of a bunch of uh, double bent acromat magnets that bent the beam around. The, this is of interest because the brightness is the photon flux divided by the electron beam emittance, and that beam emittance goes by the bend, the bend angle uh, to the third power. So if two is good, three is even better. And if three is good, a whole bunch are good. So there's now a lot of interest in these multi-bend acromats. Oops, I think I did, I did the same thing. Yeah, uh, 
possible by improvements in permanent magnets, et cetera. But uh, the earliest design, as far as I know, actually came uh, from an idea for super beam, so something that came from high energy physics. This shows you uh, existing storage rings, uh, not with multi band acrobats, those that are being upgraded, those that are under construction. And two of those are in the US. So if we take this undulator as is, uh, and it's not very long, then the motions of the electrons are uncorrelated and the radiated power goes like the number of electrons. Uh, if one makes this longer and longer and longer, then the electric field of the radiation uh, interacts with the, the bunch. And so what was a sausage of electrons starts to get micro bunched uh, and eventually turns into pancakes of electrons. Uh, there, that uh, causes a huge gain in the radiated intensity. Um, and so now the power goes like the number of electrons squared. And once these are pancakes, uh, the gain saturates and there's not much more you can get out of it. Uh, and so this is a free electron laser. Uh, what free electron lasers have done is they've made possible extremely intense, extremely short pulses. And the world's first hard X-ray laser was the Linear Coherent Light Source at Slack in 2009. And so just as a comparison, a storage ring pulse uh, to an FEL pulse, uh, an FEL pulse is uh, a billion times uh, more intense and 10,000 times shorter. And all of, the, all of the qualities that go into a bright beam are things that a laser buys you. What kinds of things can you do with this? So this opened up the era of femtosecond pump probe experiments. So a, a sample is excited by uh, something that puts energy into it. And then the X-ray probe is scanned in time across that. And this, this allows one to see uh, things happening at the femtosecond time scale. Another thing that's possible uh, is this idea called diffract before destroy. Uh, and in this example, there are a bunch of individual particles, in this case, molecules, uh, and they uh, interact one by one with the X-ray beam. The X-ray beam uh, is so intense that it completely ionizes everything and the particle undergoes an unpleasant thing called Coulomb expansion, which I try to avoid. Uh, but because the pulse is so short, it passes through and the, the diffracted image is collected before the particles destroyed. As an example of something that one uh, can learn from that, uh, na nature is able in photosystem two to take in four photons at four different times and use that to split water into oxygen and hydrogen. This would be a useful thing to do uh, since that would allow artificial photosynthesis. And exactly how this has worked um, it has, has been a mystery because uh, the first part of it happens very fast and uh, I'll spare you the details, but by using this combination of diffract before destroy and other X-ray uh, spectroscopy uh, with free electron laser, it was possible to uh, get structural information here. With a typical storage ring light source, there are many pulses. Uh, they're not very intense. Uh, with LCLS, there are a few pulses. They're very intense. Um, so in a storage ring, these pulses are separated by are picoseconds wide, nanojoules tall, separated by nanoseconds. Here, they're femtoseconds wide, millijoules tall, separated by milliseconds. So when you compare the peak brightness of this to, the, to a pulse like this, it's an extremely large number, but on average, uh, it's the same uh, amount of light just packaged in a different way. So there's now an interest to overcome the limitations of warm Lenox with superconducting uh, radio frequency. Uh, and the first one of these was the European XFEL. Uh, the second uh, will be LCLS2. And here's, here is a technology, superconducting RF, that is of active use and development for nuclear physics, high energy physics, and BES. Uh, for neutrons, there are spallation sources, accelerator-based, uh, and reactor sources. The ones in the US are here and here, and um, there are upgrades being planned. As an example of something one can do 
with a neutron source. Uh, this is monitoring uh, an internal combustion engine as it's operating and uh, looking at the strain evolution in a new alloy that's in the cylinder head uh, and looking in kind of details at um, what's happening to the material as it's operating. Lastly, I want to mention the first uh, um, experimental tool, uh, and that's the ultra high brightness electron LINAC, uh, also known as electron microscope. And uh, uh, Feynman said about 60 years ago that you could just solve everything if you could just see where all the atoms are, but the electron microscope is 100 times too bad to do that. So that's been fixed. Uh, and this is a kind of recent example uh, of the kinds of things that are now possible. So this is a iron platinum nanoparticle, and it was possible to identify the location and the type of every atom in this nanoparticle that has about 20,000 atoms in it. So how do we see all those things? Until about 10 years ago, if you were looking at x-rays or you looked at electrons, the way you looked at them was all pretty much the same. Uh, and it was a fiber coupled phosphor read out by a CCD. One thing that has been impactful uh, is the use of hybrid pixel X-ray detectors. Here's an example with uh, using them to do uh, macromolecular crystallography, protein crystallography. And this shows uh, the number of protein structures that um, each year uh, have been determined. And of course, uh, this was very much an outgrowth of the LHC, even though it started a little bit before that. Similarly, on the electron side, uh, the use of CMOS image sensors uh, overcame a lot of limitations and uh, turned cryo-electron microscopy uh, into a very powerful technique uh, for looking at uh, biological structures. And that's had a kind of an exponential takeoff in those structures. and. Um, at least in my case, this definitely had an ILC connection to it. I, I wanna say something about data. It's a little bit different. Yep. Uh, and that is um, A, and I took a very parochial example just from my local electron microscopy center. So a microscope today uh, will put out order hundreds of gigabytes per second. And then you multiply this by n microscopes. It's a lot of data. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of thinking about how to handle this. One thing that's different uh, from particle physics is there is not really an obvious way to trigger. Um, so uh, there, there's certainly opportunity for um, knowledge exchange. Uh, then I wanna highlight how these things uh, in BES are developed. Um, and so that's, there is a program that is somewhat similar uh, to what exists in high energy physics uh, to, to do accelerating detector development. Uh, Part of it is to improve facilities and make them more useful. Um, I'll kind of spare you the details, but this is an example of the kinds of things that are being done. Uh, so these are a lot of um, accelerator based uh, things that are being supported. And the, the pi, which is smaller than the HDP pi, goes to support uh, a lot of different kinds of things uh, from accelerating structures to X-ray optics uh, detector research, et cetera. So this, is, this has been HEP inspired, but uh, hasn't, has not gotten to the size uh, to match. Kinds of things that, are, that it is supporting right now on the accelerator side, uh, there are a lot of things that you can see here that improve uh, free electron lasers um, uh, to make them more capable. On uh, the other side, there are things to improve uh, detectors, uh, materials, um, and diffractive optics. The investments that are being made right now. So here are uh, investments, const current construction projects in X-ray storage ring upgrades. So these are the multi-band acromat type upgrades. There's one at the advanced photon source um, and there's one at the advanced light source. Uh, these are the price tags. Uh, these are when they are scheduled to be complete. There are uh, two upgrades happening uh, at the splation neutron source one to increase the power, uh, the other to build a second target station. This is a fairly large endeavor. And there's the upgrade of LCLS to, uh, 
to go from a low rep rate uh, to high rep rate free electron laser. And that also has a non negligible price tag to it. I do want to say there are uh, areas of kind of genuine overlap besides the things mentioned uh, before, um, where there are kind of studies together on things like uh, quantum, quantum information science, improved ways of uh, computation, microelectronics. So there are some things where the material science aspect and the general needs um, kind of do have a mechanism to work together. And so kind of the last thing I leave here as maybe a lead in to further discussion um, are uh, what are things that have been in the past uh, connections. Um, those are accelerator based probes. What has made a difference kind of in the BES side is that one has gone from kind of really blurry snapshots to high speed movies. There are common interests in various technological things, QIS, microelectronics. There are the possibility of material science advances uh, toward uh, HEP goals. Uh, a laser is a materials problem, superconducting RF. And there's already been some hints of BES facilities for HEP experiments. So I think I have figured, finished in advance of time. So uh, we now move to the panel uh, portion. I hope you've all been thinking of questions to ask our uh, guest experts here. If they'll all come forward and sit on these comfortable seats here. Um, we'll start that portion. So um, I will be taking alternating questions from the live audience and uh, Yuri will be uh, taking questions if you raise your hand on Zoom. I don't think we have, do we have anything on the Google question? We have a few of those as well. So um, I think we'll, we'll start with someone um, from the audience here. Um, Uh, thank you very much to all three speakers for the excellent presentation. I have a question to the basic science. I mean, um, uh, thank you for the really impressive presentation. As a person who is coming from the HEP and not so much involved in basic sciences, I understand accelerators, as you mentioned, one of the points upgradable as CLS2. But there are many things, as you mentioned, in microelectronics and other things. But do you think there is particular area where the collaboration is not up to date between basic science and high energy physics and it can be significantly advanced from your perspective. Is there is some area where you see there is really gap in collaboration? Thank you. So, so uh, partly as uh, I, I didn't have the nicely drawn silos, uh, but those silos do exist. Um, I, I, the, I, I think there are many areas where Essentially, the, the I mean, to first order the tools uh, uh, benefit from common development. That's sort of that's the most obvious. That would be the easiest hurdle to overcome. Um, uh, and then from there, um, you know, one could be more expansive in trying to think of potential scientific questions. But if one could even just get to the point of, uh, as I think people have tried to do in Europe, to just try to unify these developments, I think it would be effective for all the all the communities involved okay and uh, we have a question on zoom uh, Bangalore you can unmute yourself hi thank you very much I hope you can hear me this question is for will Paul um, I was wondering will in the intersections that you talked about um, amongst the high energy physics that one can do is uh, probably search for dark matter. Can you say a bit more about what do you think are the prospect of discovering dark matter with gravitational waves? I guess. Okay. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, 
there's sort of two fronts along which to proceed, I suppose. One of them is to the extent that gravitational waves give us a better understanding of cosmology and the cosmological expansion. Um, just like any other probe, that will potentially inform about the nature of dark matter. Um, and then there are um, very interesting tests that have to do with the fact that if dark matter has substructure of the right size, then that can also influence the propagation or um, lensing of gravitational waves. Um, you know, that's more speculative. It requires a convenient size of substructure, but that is something that is definitely under active investigation and something that, that we are attuned to. Um, th that's what comes to mind Im immediately. Uh, probably there's others um, if I sat down and thought about it longer. Oh, yes, of course. Okay, thank Thanks. you. Um, yeah, Baralena was shouting out from the audience, axions. Um, in certain circumstances, if the, there's a light scalar particle and its um, mass gives it a Compton wavelength that's comparable to the ergosphere region in a black hole, then black holes can super radiantly produce axions. Um, and then you get a signal both the black hole spins down. So you discover that a certain range of black hole masses never has high spin, ever because it spins itself down very rapidly with this axion production. And then also you have a rotating asymmetric axion cloud around the black hole, which produces its own gravitational waves as it, as it slowly spins down itself. Um, the, uh, the, the masses that we're sensitive to there, if I remember right, are like 10 to the minus 22 or 10 to the minus 23 EV, but I, don't quote me on that. I'd have to look it up. Thank you. Uh, so we'll take a question from the audience. Um, Uh, thank you. Uh, Frank Simon from the Max Planck Institute for Physics in Munich. Uh, I also have a question on the gravitational waves and uh, on sort of the interplay with projects in, in other regions. Uh, there are, of course, uh, ideas like Einstein Telescope in Europe. There's Kagura coming on in Japan. Is there, are these already at a level where you sort of need a similar strategy process? Like here we constantly refer to strategies in other regions as well, right, that somehow have to match. Or is that still at a level where to say, okay, uh, we still can get multiple such instruments on various places of the earth and profit from it, or is already sort of global um, prioritization required? Um, so I have a, that, that's an excellent question. Um, I will say, you know, we're already quite accustomed to working with worldwide networks of gravitational wave detectors. Um, the, in the time that I've been involved, we have been the LIGO Virgo collaboration, and we recently became the LIGO Virgo CAGRA collaboration. Um, Kagra is a uh, new Jap Japanese project for gravitational wave detectors. So there is a certain amount of global coordination on the scientific aspects. Um, if you're asking about the scale, so on, you know, on the back of an envelope today, the scale of cosmic explorer is of order a billion dollars. The scale of the Einstein telescope is comparable. Those are big, but not massive projects. So I think it is definitely achievable in principle to have multiple next generation ground based gravitational wave detectors. The scientific coordination seems well in hand. I, I am not the right person to comment on the strategic coordination among, you know, scientific agencies in the different countries, but that seems from afar also to be in progress. Okay, um, we'll take another uh, question from the audience. I'm Jason Nielsen from University of California, Santa Cruz. This question's for David. So you had your cartoon at the beginning saying, I'm from HEP, I'm from NP, can we work on something together? My question is, is the next panel more likely, let's find a science topic that's interesting for both HEP and NP, or let's find different science topics that require the same facility? I'm trying to understand what you actually said. Is it, it's really bad op audio here. Is the, say, would you just repeat, is it this or that part of it? Sure, is it more likely they have a single science goal that spans both high energy and nuclear or that they have a single facility with different science goals for high energy and nuclear? Ah, I, I, people often talk about mergers of science agencies and so on that's usually if you work it out a disastrous idea there's really very different overall scopes of the different agencies nuclear physics 
you know, the real true picture of nuclear physics was nicely portrayed by Paul Sorensen yesterday. It's sort of, and this is sort of one edge of the phase space in a Venn diagram that overlaps a bit. Regarding a facility, uh, what would be the magic facility that would, if that's what you're asking, that would, that would serve many, many users? Uh, a long time ago, when Fermilab was thinking about its future, I was in on an exercise or two that we were listening and it, it wasn't clear if, if the beams would be nice, be able to be used by nuclear physics. It wouldn't be whether that was a welcome thing or not a welcome thing. It was a question of what was the priority. The lab was prioritizing at the time, collider and so on. And I think I'm really just unable to answer agency questions of this sort more than that, but I sort of like the way it is going now, to be honest. In my collaboration, for what? How did what? What? What happened? What do you mean? Yeah. Yes. Of course. And I mean, G minus two is pretty clear. It's one thing. It's pretty easy to say. Uh, the the other the other things that you saw on that one the, on the one slide that followed the little cannons, where in which I showed dozens of different experiments. They're all single purpose experiments, uniquely designed expressly toward the purpose of that, of that particular number. It's completely the opposite of a collider, which I used to teasingly say is E plus E minus goes to PRL, you know, I mean, it, and, and, and so on. I mean, there are a thousand papers out of it. There's such, so, so in the collider type community, you have built an, ex, an experiment which can see everything. And then you guys divide typically into analysis groups to, to chase those things down. Sometimes as smaller groups as ours are smaller. What, what we have to do is say, if you want to look at something like lepton flavor violation in some system that Bob Bernstein is doing with mu to E or so, that is decades and decades of effort to just measure that one thing. I mean, if we get a second paper out of it, yay. You know, but um, that's, a, that's the nature. That's the nature of high precision. Thanks. Um, uh, we don't have questions. We have some comments uh, in the chat, but um, we also have questions in the audience. Thank you. Uh, Mark Thompson, UK Science and Technology Facilities Councillors. Question, question for Peter. Uh, you mentioned the data challenges around um, synchrotrons, cryo EM, which are very real. And you also mentioned the fact that uh, people don't like throwing data away, triggering. How much work is going on in the US in kind of lossless data compression and actually addressing, addressing the challenges of data in uh, basic energy sciences? So I, I would say this is, it, it's definitely a growing uh, by necessity uh, activity. Um, there, uh, there, there's always, of course, the hope that uh, AIML will save everything. Um, this, uh, we'll see how true that is. Um, but th there's starting to be uh, collaborations across the light sources to look at ways of how, how to deal with this. Um, so one, just to say, one, one big difference between high energy physics and basic energy sciences is HEP knew very well what was coming uh, and BES did not uh, and, and was certainly not prepared for it. Um, so it's, it's, been, it's been lagging and the difficulty of having something like a trigger that makes it relatively straightforward um, is, is a bit of a challenge because oftentimes serendipity uh, turns out to be very advantageous. Okay, let's uh, call an online question by Sridhar. Yes, Sridhar, you can unmute yourself. Okay, um, we'll communicate. Sorry, I could, oh, we couldn't figure out how to unmute properly from this. Anyway, yeah, my question is for Peter Dennis. Um, one would think that a few meter sized X ray sources would be very useful for best research in general. Uh, how do you visualize the BES community supporting uh, R&D into new technologies like those that are used, uh, proposed for the cool copper collider? These are uh, 150 MeV per meter gradient, um, normal connecting RF and things of that nature. I'm afraid I only caught about 5% of that. It's very hard to hear. We're, we're in some node here. Did, can someone 
<laughs> I completely sympathize with that. <laughs> Be there. I was just asking, how do you propose the BES community supports uh, new technologies like those proposed for the cool copper collider? So if it were up to me, uh, that would be very easy. Um, so this uh, BES accelerating detector research program was an attempt to uh, copy what high energy physics did in K25. It just never grew to the, uh, to the desired scale. Um, so this is definitely something that is, is only gonna be solved by collaboration um, and some attempt to uh, in increase the, the pie that has many slices. So I, I, hope that answered, I hope that answered the question you asked. Yeah, I did. Uh, okay, do we have a question in the audience? Is someone okay? Uh, Gil Paz, Wayne State University. So this is a question for David. You mentioned at the very end some for the long range plan for nuclear physics, some pion and muon projects or experiments. Could you elaborate on that, please? The long range plan process is literally just starting. In, similar to your community, there will be town meetings in the, in the fall. There will be one on fundamental symmetries and neutrinos. Now you might say, well, what are they going to, what are they going to bring? I could see from my perspective. So I'm, I had a little talk here a few days ago on a new experiment with rare pion decays. I certainly hope to be pushing, you know, that thing into the like acceptance or non-acceptance, let's say thing. If I take something like muon G minus two, we're kind of in the last cycles of running. Next year we should run one more time. I hope years of analyzing the data. I don't think in a long range plan, you ask necessarily much about that, but the, but the charge left on flavor violation program certainly will be something that people will think about. It's not, interestingly, not a lot of people, if any, I'm not even sure, from the nuclear physics community, given that it's a stop you know, and it's amusing to me, are in that, in those experiments. It's, that's the silo problem. It's, you know, it's a very strange thing about that, but that's true. Um, going forward, I think there's going to be a very strong emphasis with the limited dollars on the ones I did mention, like the molar experiment, the neutron EDM experiment, and the, new, the mass of the neutrino. These are things you can measure and do. They sort of seem to me when you can measure something that's valuable and you kind of know how to do it, maybe you ought to do that. Thank you. Right, uh, let's take one question from uh, the Zoom audience. Chandra? Okay. So can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So the question is that, you know, in fact, uh, somebody made a comment that uh, the possibility of using these uh, high energy accelerators for nuclear physics or, you know, uh, th that could be a little bit uh, more problematic. But actually, my question is that uh, we know that especially in the case of uh, the electron positron collider whether it is c cube or uh, you know uh, any the click or any one of these or linear uh, ilc any one of them there will be some downtime on probably on uh, say uh, on the uh, positron side i don't know okay so during that particular time is there any way that we can accommodate some high energy nuclear physics that somebody is interested to do. It has to be coordinated properly. I guess if I can understand the question, maybe it's the use of a single beam in the collider facility if let's say a positron source is down. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right, so yeah, I think the question is about whether there are opportunities for a fixed target program at a collider facility. Is a dedicated fixed target program for nuclear physics or when one of the beams is down, use the, use the beam for some uh, scattering measurements. Ah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think the question was about... <laughs> I, I know, I, I know this is really very uh, interesting one, but actually the people who are uh, at the work in the accelerator 
outside there, we know what is actually you know, any time. So if we can coordinate it, we can use the machine uh, more effectively. Yeah, but I think that's the question it. Was about uses of uh, single beams in the collider facility for some nuclear physics measurements, sort of like in station A at SLA. You answer that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's certainly 40 years of history of that. <laughs> I guess we're uh, going on. So, um, uh, why don't you uh, ask a question? Yeah, be your turn. Yes, uh, there are people who are considering measuring gravitational waves by dropping cold atoms down a tunnel. Uh, could you could you give us your 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 opinion on that technology and prospects? Thank you. Uh, I think people should absolutely try to do that. You're really asking the wrong person about the technological aspects. Um, I think it strikes me it's been demonstrated conclusively that cold atom interferometers are exceptional gravimeters. I don't know that the technology is yet ready to be detecting gravitational waves, but I will say even gravimeters of sufficient precision, the experimenters tell me, can be very useful for next generation ground-based detectors. The ultimate noise source at low frequencies, um, once you get sufficient isolation in the suspension of the mirrors, is gravity gradients. And they're, you know, unshieldable. Atmospheric pressure waves come through, graduate students walk past the in-station, you know, there's no way to shield that. But there is a way to measure that and potentially actively control it. So if nothing else, even if none of the hopes of you know, cold atom interferometry for gravitational wave detection materialize, they can still be exceptionally useful. Of course, I hope those hopes do materialize, but you know, again, you're asking the wrong person about the technical prospects for that. This is not such a good uh, this, this is another. Another question for Will Farr, following up some of these questions about uh, exotic dark matter or dark matter that wouldn't be detectable in the laboratory, like primordial black holes um, or dark matter in another sector. I've heard suggestions that dark matter in another sector could make uh, phase transitions that we're not aware of, but they would create gravitational waves. So I wanted you to comment on that and the sensitivity, how far can Cosmic Explorer conceivably see that? And a second question is, what about really high redshift? We, we know that the formation of structure and the particle physics community is very involved in supporting DESI and future experiments to study early formation of structure. You mentioned how high the redshift reaches. Could we conceivably look at structure at Z of 20? Yeah, those are excellent questions. Um, I'll go in reverse order. Um, so for a, a 10 solar mass, 10 solar mass black hole merger in the current designs for the next generation gravitational wave telescope, the horizon is something like redshift 100. So if the formation of structure produces compact objects that are of order tens of solar masses and they merge as part of that structure formation, at really any conceivable redshift where that would be happening, we can see it. Um, if primordial black holes are in that kind of mass range, they would immediately become apparent as a signal of mergers that are occurring at redshift sufficiently high that these objects are not of stellar origin, you know, pre-reionization, for example. Um, in terms of stochastic backgrounds from phase transitions, your guess is as good as mine what the amplitude of that might be, probably rather better. But I will say something I left out of my talk, but I know has been discussed earlier in this meeting, is whether these next generation detectors will have an overwhelming astrophysical stochastic background from ordinary neutron star mergers, black hole mergers, and so on. And the next generation detectors on the ground, I think are unique in that basically every single compact object merger in the universe is directly or nearly directly detectable. 
So if you looked at that plot that I showed, there were tracks of compact object mergers. They occupied a very small fraction of the time frequency plane. All of the places where there aren't compact object mergers in the time frequency plane are available to you to look for stochastic backgrounds. So there is no astrophysical foreground from the known sources of you know, gravitational waves of compact object mergers that would sit on top of whatever background you would like to look for due to phase transitions, say, in the early universe. So uh, we're out of time now. Um, let's thank all our speakers for a very fascinating panel. Yeah,